Hello, my name is Sydney Halpin and I'm the president of the New Jersey Jazz Society and I'd like to welcome you to this presentation today. This is part of our partnership with the Metuchen Arts Council and this is our jazz education series which has been going for the last several months. Um, the New Jersey Jazz Society is a 49-year-old organization dedicated to the preservation, promotion, and presentation of jazz. And for more information about the Jazz Society, I encourage you to go to our website, njjs.org, where you can learn more about the society, you can become a member, you can access our award-winning magazine. And because you've joined us today, I'm gonna give you a little secret. We're gonna give you a gift. If you would like to see the magazine, you may access it with the password, my way, two words, my way. There's a space between them. And I hope you will go to the website and look that up and enjoy that. And before uh, going into what will be the most amazing presentation this afternoon with Will Friedwald, I really would like to thank all of you who've joined us in the past. I'd like to thank those of you who have donated in the past. And I would like to ask that if you are capable or able and willing to donate today, that perhaps you could do that. Um, it's been a rough year for both organizations and we could certainly use a little boost if that's possible from you. And you can easily donate today on the njjs.org website. Uh, there's a red button that says make a donation. When you click on that button, you're taken to a separate screen, uh, which will then have a yellow donate button and that will take you through and then your payment was processed through PayPal, whether you have a PayPal account or you're paying with a credit card. So anyway, again, thank you very, very much for your generosity. Um, all proceeds are split equally between the two organizations, so we could use a little help today. I also want to thank the Metuchen Arts Council for their amazing partnership in this presentation. Uh, they have really been the driving force with this, and we are so delighted to have been able to join them. Uh, with this incredible series. If you've missed any of the series, the previous shows, they are archived on the New Jersey Jazz Society, full words, New Jersey Jazz Society YouTube page, and they're really marvelous. Uh, today's program will be on our homepage for the next month, and then it will be moved to our YouTube page. And again, uh, if you've missed any of the previous programs, you don't want to miss, uh, you may reaccess them and not miss any others. Uh, so be, to get this ball rolling today, I really would love and I would love, I would love and am delighted to present my colleague, Lynn Mueller. Lynn Mueller is uh, part of the Metuchen Arts Council. And uh, Lynn is a, a resident scholar in her own right. Uh, and uh, she's been an absolute delight to work with as has her colleagues on this series. Um, Lynn is considered the leader of the, I believe she's the council leader for the Batuchin Arts Council, and she is clearly a tireless, tireless advocate for jazz, all things jazz. So without further ado, thank you again for joining us, and I give you Lynn Mueller. Well, thank you, Cindy, very much for the introduction. I'm actually the person that, that is in charge of the jazz, and uh, from Metuchen Arts. It's Bob Dyken, who is the chair of the uh, Metuchen Arts Council. So we are delighted to partner with New Jersey Jazz Society in presenting this virtual jazz education series. And we thank you, Sydney, who, and you are president of the organization, and Sanford Josephson, who is the vice president of publicity, for taking this journey with us. We are grateful to have your significant help in publicizing and producing this virtual program. We also thank Christine Vanderlis, the Society's amazing video sound engineer for this event. She's done an amazing job. Since 1968, Metuchen Arts Council has been the premier arts organization in Metuchen, New Jersey, supporting and promoting all aspects of the arts, visual, music, theater, and dance. As I mentioned, Bob Dyken uh, is the chairman and thanks to him, MAC is gaining wider recognition throughout central New Jersey. Our website is metuchenartscouncil.com. Virtual Jazz Education Series joins our list of Metuchen Jazz offerings, including festivals, concerts, and brunches. This is our fourth lecture in this series. Previous presentations are archived on njjs.org and YouTube. 
It is a privilege for me to introduce Will Friedwald to you today. He and I go back a long way. I first met him at our Duke Ellington Society meetings years ago. Since then, he has become one of, if not the, world's expert on vocalists and pop and jazz themes. He has written 10 books, which have included, among others, Sinatra, The Song Is You, Tony Bennett, The Good Life, and most recently, Straighten Up and Fly Right, The Life and Music of Nat King Cole. Will Friedwald writes about music and popular culture for the Wall Street Journal, Vanity Fair, Playboy Magazine, and City View. He has written over 600 liner notes for compact discs, received 11 Grammy nominations, and he appears frequently on television and other documentaries. Will is also a consultant and curator for Apple Music. Will Friedwood also curates Clip Joint, a live stream video presentation covering many different topics of music and popular culture. Just send them an email if you want to become part of his list, wfriedwald at gmail.com. Please write your questions for Will in the chat box during his presentation. Then at the end, he will be happy to answer them. Please welcome Will Friedwald as he presents Nat King Cole at 100. Hey, thank you. I re that's the greatest introduction I've ever gotten. And I really appreciate it because more than anything else, I am a man who needs an introduction. You know, the problem with uh, telling jokes on, uh, on virtual spaces, you know, you don't, I'm glad you were laughing. Thank you. I appreciate that. But um, I'm so thrilled uh, to talk about Nat King Cole, his, his, uh, his importance to American culture, to musical culture is, is so enormous. I feel like this book, what was it? Like 500 pages. I barely scratched the surface. Uh, there's just so much to say about him. Just the most incredible man. Um, and, uh, and a man who had an impact on certainly on jazz as, I mean, he's, he's the only guy we could say even, even conservatively, um, He's definitely one of the 10 greatest jazz piano players of all time. Certainly Oscar Peterson would say that. Certainly Errol Garner would say that. Certainly Bill Evans would say that. Uh, his influence on piano players from 1950 on is just incredible, just overwhelming. And at the same time, he is one of, I, I in my incredibly short list, really, I think you can, uh, of people that sang the Great American Songbook, and I'm not necessarily restricting it to jazz or pop, but people that sang the songbook, what we think of as the songbook, really it comes down to three people, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, and that King Cole. Now, that's not to say that, you know, uh, Ben Crosby, Sarah Vaughan, all kinds of people didn't, you know, make amazing contributions, but really the way the songbook is sung today, when you hear somebody sing the music of Irving Berlin or George Gershwin or Rodgers and Hart, they come down to those three guys. Those are the three primary colors, Sinatra, Ella and Nat King Cole. And there's nobody else who's on both lists. It's just amazing. And I always like to start out by saying that when Nat first got involved with music, when he was, you know, just studying the piano as a young man, all he wanted to do was play the piano. He had no idea. If you'd have told him that he was going to be famous as a singer, you know, he, he wouldn't have believed you. So he started out wanting to be a piano player and a band leader. Eventually, became you know one of the most popular singers of all time. Uh, for a while, he was the most popular singer. But the third identity of Nat, which I also get into in the book, uh, if you told him that someday he would uh, be a de facto civil rights leader, that he would have a whole, a huge impact on the way African-Americans are perceived and what it means to be black in America, if you'd have told him that, he would have really thought you were crazy. But that's essentially what happened. And he became uh definitely a figure in you know what became the civil rights movement without even trying to be and we'll talk a little bit about that so let us start the start oh there we go i want to give a big thanks uh christine is everything that sydney said she is she's quite remarkable so that is the cover of my book let me see oh and there i go this is this is just sort of the the oh wait it's it's playing i gotta pause it oh that's right ha well um, I like to start with this. This is actually 
uh, the front piece of the book. Oh, and I want to thank Seth Berg and the Nat King Cole Estate South Bay Music, including his two daughters, uh, Casey and Timelin, his last surviving children, who are exactly 60 in about eight days. So a big birthday tribute to Nat's two daughters, Casey and Timelin. They are gorgeous, wonderful women, and I love them dearly. And they were very kind to share the personal photo archive that Nat's wife, Maria, kept. And this is a photo from that archive. In 1954, um, Nat played the London Palladium. And for about a month before he got there, this was his second trip to Europe, for a month before he got there, they had a jukebox in the lobby that had nothing but Nat King Cole records, and you could play any song for free. It was a way of promoting the upcoming uh, engagement. And it says on the jukebox, which is a, a uh, minstrel, the, the, the name of the manufacturing company is Minstrel Jukeboxes. I should look into that. But um, it says right on the jukebox itself, he who pays the minstrel calls the tune, which I think is pretty prophetic. You want to call the tune? You got to pay the minstrel. And this is minstrel in like the Elizabethan sense, not really the, uh, you know, the American, the, the, the burnt cork sense. So this is that same engagement. And uh, we're going to talk about how at this point, certainly from the mid 50s, the years right up to the emergence of Elvis and rock and roll, Nat King Cole is the biggest thing there is. The most popular recording artist, the most popular singer. Uh, the, in, in the in the known world. Uh, literally, he is selling more records than anybody, even Frank Sinatra, even Perry Como, even Dinah Shore, anybody you could think of that was a big sell at this point. Nat King Cole is at the top of the list. More hits in any given season than anyone else. And yet, here he is at the height of his fame. And if you can read the inscription there, this is, again, this is obviously the London Palladium, but it says right above his name, America's sensational colored recording star. It's like they're not going to let him forget it. No matter how popular and how internationally beloved he is, they have to let you know that he's colored. You know, it's just, uh, uh, this was, this was uh, you know, the conditions that uh, prevail. Here we are. Now, in 1959, Nat did something extraordinary. He toured South America. Now, in the 50s, the idea of an international tour was brand new. Jets were just being rolled out. Um, 20s, 30s, occasionally a band would go over to England or, or Europe once in a while, but it was pretty rare. And the idea that a, a singer would do an international tour was pretty much unknown. Even Sinatra just toured a little bit in Australia and certain places. And nobody had done what Nat did, which is to go to South America, particularly Brazil. And he played about 10 concerts for audiences of about 25, 30,000 people each. They put him in these, it was the first time that there was a recording artist, a popular artist who was so popular that they couldn't find a concert hall big enough. And for the first time they converted sports stadiums. So these are some of the crowds. I'm just gonna let this play. These are some of the crowds that came out to see that. That's, this is in Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro. There and there you can see Nat is there, just to, so you know I'm not making it up. Now this is Nat in the same tour he's in Peru. When he arrives in Peru, it's such a big deal that there's newsreel cameramen to uh, film him and his wife and his band getting off the airplane. And you can see all the crowds that are greeting him in the Peru airport here. So that's 1959. This is actually a few years earlier. In 1953, when he reached the 10th anniversary of his relationship with Capitol Records, they threw a huge party. And I believe Sinatra was there. Everybody was there. Nobody even, and that was just getting started at this point. But in 10 years, he sold 15 million singles, which is amazing, uh, and 5 million albums. I don't even know how many people had... Um, album players had long playing uh, phonograph turntables in 1953. But given the statistics, I would bet that everybody who owned an LP turntable had at least one album by Nat King Cole. Five million albums at this hey, point Tillman. is an amazing number. This is Nat closer to the very end of his life. This is 1964. Uh, he was very close with both uh, Eddie Rochester Anderson 
and uh, Jack Benny. In fact, they both were at his funeral. And sadly, his funeral was only about a year after this. But Nat made this appearance on the Jack Benny show. And they talk about, uh, the you know, just his popularity and the number of records he was selling. And again, this is 10 years after that clipping. This is his sales figures by 1964. The hit records. Uh, there's something I want to ask you. What does a performer get from the sale of each record? You see, it varies. Generally, it's between four and five cents a copy. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Gee, you must sell four or five hundred thousand copies a year. Yeah. Well, Jack, the other day, the recording company told me that I've been averaging about uh, seven million records a year. Seven million? <laughs> well, now I know why old King Cole is such a merry old soul. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see... <laughs> What? You see, Jack, what? it's really not the money, you know, it's, that's not so important. It's the satisfaction you get going through this world, making people happy. You see, the money is very unimportant. Oh, you're, you're so right. <laughs> uh, you feel that way? What? Do you feel that way? Uh, for you, yes. For me, no. <laughs> but uh, Just a sad note. Like I say, a year after that, Nat was in the hospital, essentially dying of lung cancer. And the guy who came to visit him most often was Jack Benny. Um, and Maria was encouraging Jack to come because she said that he could always make Nat laugh, no matter how much pain he was in. But anyhow, in, in the mid 50s, this is, I think, 1957, Nat was the first, uh, just about the first African-American to be admitted to the famous Friars Club back when the Friars still had a Los Angeles branch, a Los Angeles monastery. And they threw a huge party for Nat in 1957, at which both Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin came in to pay their respects. And of course, Nat's fame goes even beyond that, as we will see. Uh, in 1960, well, in 1956, he was invited for the first time to play uh, the White House at the, at the, at the White House Correspondents uh, Press Dinner, and he got to meet President Eisenhower. And then um, in 1961, he was invited to entertain at the inaugural gala for President John F. Kennedy, which was a very big deal to have. There were no less than four uh, African-American entertainers on the uh, 1961 gala, including Ella Fitzgerald, Mah not Mahalia Jackson, um, Harry Belafonte, I think it was Mahalia Jackson was the other one, yes, and which was an, an, an amazing thing. I mean, you know, they had, they had come a long way even from, say, five years earlier. But that is, and I'll tell another story about Nat King Cole and John F. Kennedy, too, in a second. But we'll go back now to uh, the beginning of Nat's career, the King Cole Trio. And this is really, in the book, I divide it between act one. So this is the earliest known picture that we have of Nat. This has been published. And when Nat was, this is Nat is either 10 or 11 here. In 1930, he was already a piano prodigy. He was only 11 years old. And the Regal Theater, which is the number one theater in the south side of Chicago, uh, you know, for, for uh African-American patrons, they had an annual talent event for youngsters, for, for younger uh, performers, every year at Thanksgiving, and that won it four years in a row. And the prize was a turkey, which meant, his, because, uh, well, Nat actually had five siblings at this point. Well, there were five kids all together, so they could really use that turkey. And Nat's father, uh, Nat had been born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1919, they moved to Chicago, where Nat's father became a Baptist minister. And uh, by 1930, like I say, Nat was already very much under the spell of Earl Father Hines. He was his number one influence as a piano player. And all he really wanted to be at this point was another Earl Hines. By this point, his brother, not Freddie. Freddie was the much younger brother who was only born in 1931. But his older brother, Eddie, was already a professional musician. In 1930, he was touring Europe as a member of Noble Sissel and his Sizzling Syncopators, which was one of the early uh, black bands to play Europe. So here's Nat's uh, first band. This is 1934. Nat is 15, amazingly enough. And he's already both the tallest, he's the t well, he's the youngest member of the band 
and the tallest, as you can see. And he was already making a name for him, uh, you know, for himself all over Chicago. In fact, if you read uh, the Chicago Defender, which is the paper, the, you know, the African American paper in Chicago, he's mentioned all the time. And every time he played a ballroom uh, with this band, he got a write up. And there's lots of photos, lots of early photos of him. We'll see another one in a second. Yeah, that's another early shot of Nat. He's about 16 here. And they talk about him as a rising band leader in Chicago. At this point, uh, his, like I say, his ambition was to be the next Earl Hines, to be a virtuoso piano player and have his own big band. Oh, and I think it's where I want to point out, at every step of his evolution, Nat always had to be the guy in charge. He always was uh, the, 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 the master of his fate, uh, the leader of his own destiny. He never wanted even as good a piano player as he was he never wanted to be you know any other piano player would have probably gotten a job in, an, in somebody else's band as a way to start but no Nat's way to do it was to always have his own group whether it was a big band or a trio he always as he pointed it out later on i always had to be the guy who stuck his neck out <laughs> he always had a way of uh uh sort of uh, you know not taking credit for for things for sort of you know self-deprecation uh, in that particular moment. He didn't want to look, make it look like he had too too high an opinion of himself. Here's some more advertisements from the Chicago Defender and Lynn Muller and other Ellington Ellingtonians take note. Look who Nat is sharing the bill with, Ray Nance. Ray Nance, uh, who had his own big band at the same time that Nat did in Chicago. In, and this is still 1935. So here we have, oh, so the next thing that happens, and we'll, these are, this is slightly out of sequence. I mentioned that Nat's brother, Eddie, and he mentioned that he was playing with Noble Sissel. Noble Sissel, creator of the most famous African-American musical show ever, really to this day, Shuffle Along. Um, Shuffle Along was a blockbuster hit in 1921. In 1936, one of the co-creators, Flournoy Miller decided to have a new production which would be touring in the Midwest and they were going to launch from Chicago. So Noble Sissel apparently recommended Eddie Cole and Eddie by that point was working with Nat. They had their own band. In fact, they made a record. I'll show you the label in a second. But they decided to go on the road uh, with this production of Shuffle Along and Nat and Eddie had a had a big fight, so Eddie decided to stay in Chicago. He was tired of the road anyhow. He'd already been to Paris and London with Noble Sissel. So Eddie stays in Chicago, and uh, they go. Nat goes on the road conducting with his company of Shuffle Along. And here is, in fact, that's, by the way, that's the very first record. That record was technically Nat's band, but because Eddie had a bigger name, they released it under Eddie's name, but it was really Nat's group, even though Eddie was playing bass. And this is what Nat and Eddie were fighting about. Um, Nat had fallen in love with this really beautiful dancer who happened to be uh, 11 years older. And he took her on the road with him as part of this, com this, this, this company of Shuffle Along. And they decided to get married when they hit Ypsilanti, Michigan. No, nothing says romance and marriage and matrimony like Ypsilanti, Michigan. Well, they got married. And as you can see, you really can't tell the age difference because she's, you know, she has a kind of timeless beauty. And that looks very mature, very tall. Um, I'm sure he, he lied about his age. On he, I think he said he was 21 on the wedding certificate, so they didn't have to get his parents' permission. But uh, that was the first wife, Nadine Robinson. And so they get to California. And the way Nat tells the story, some light footed rascal and that would be joking about it in later years but it really was a serious thing some light footed rascal made off with the payroll they took off all the box office receipts there was no money to pay the band to pay the principals to pay the chorus girls so they had to disband so but nat decided he was going to stay now he always told the story Nat, as I mentioned, or I may not have mentioned was born saint patrick's day 1919 and because of that he always had a stock answer. When people ask him, Mr. Cole, to what do you attribute your great success? He would always say, I have the luck, oh, the Irish. And of course, the real answer was, 
I'm successful because I'm talented and I know what I'm doing. But he wasn't going to say that. I don't even know if he was thinking that. He always had to come up with a funny answer. So, uh, you know, kind of to diffuse the question. So he would always say, I'm successful because I have the luck, oh, the Irish. So he just happened to stay in Los Angeles. But I think he really wanted to be there. Um, remember that his parents had come up from Montgomery to Chicago to make a new life. And now Nat wanted to go from Chicago to a whole new area to make a new life for himself as well. And I think he felt that there were more opportunities in California to start fresh. Well, initially he kept the big band going for a while and they did find work and they were working around uh, uh, Los Angeles for a while. Then something happened. Da, 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 da. And we're going to talk about that. Now, here's back to This Is Your Life. When you see this picture, these two great ladies, uh, the older lady is Nat's sister, Evelyn, and the little girl is Natalie, age nine. And uh, essentially what happened was um, a, a, a restaurant owner by the name of Bob Lewis wanted to give Nat a steady gig, but he only had a very, very small bandstand, certainly not room for a big band, not even room for a quartet. And there's all kinds of different reasons why uh, they settled on a trio. Wesley Prince was the name. Oh, oop, let me slow it down. Uh, Wesley Prince was the uh, guy who came up with the name King Cole. The family name was originally C-O-L-E-S, Coles. And Wesley Prince says, hey, how about that old nursery rhyme, King Cole? And Nat had never thought of that. He always gave credit to Wesley Prince. What we're seeing now is just about the very first mention of the King Cole trio in print. And this was in these were ads that were taken out in the Los Angeles papers advertising uh, that, you know, you could come and celebrate Thanksgiving and then Christmas. We think they were founded around Labor Day, 1937. And this is Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, 1937, at the Sewanee Inn, where they were a big success. And even at this early stage, people are coming from all over, including Johnny Mercer. Uh, the story goes, Johnny Mercer came one week and was so thrilled that he brought Bing Crosby back. So both Bing Crosby and Johnny Mercer hold heard the King Cole trio within less than a month after they started working together. And by the way, just to make another plug, I already plugged my book, but um, this, like the book, this was the dream of a lifetime and the, the, the timing was great. For many years, I was gathering uh, all these early, early transcriptions that the trio made ever be way before they went to Capitol, even before they went to DECA, although the DECA sessions are here, their earliest recordings were made for different radio companies in the late 1930s. And I was able to talk resonance records into uh, letting, letting me co-produce a box set of this material. And it is, it is everything I always hoped for. It is a beautiful set. I highly recommend it if you're a Nat King Cole fan. And we actually got a Grammy nomination. We lost to Mr. Rogers. Oh, ho, ho. but uh, this is a beautiful set and I highly recommend it. And here's some samples, just uh, visually as it were. These are some of Nat's earliest, earliest recordings made with the trio for different radio organizations in, in Los Angeles. So these are very rare recordings. And But when you hear Nat singing, he sounds like Nat. He already has the sound. And of course, his keyboard is already you know phenomenal at this early stage. Now, at this point, they played a... Uh, they already had met Johnny Mercer, and then they also met Glenn Wallach. Now, in 1940, Glenn Wallach opened a music store, which would be the most famous sort of music retail outlet. They sold records, they sold sheet music, they sold instruments. It was a whole music store called Music City, right in the heart of Hollywood, right across the street from NBC. You could see the outside on the right, and on the left is... Uh, the inside, and this is the opening. You can see that Nat and Wesley and Oscar are the only African Americans in this crowd. But uh, this, we believe, this is the opening of Music City, and it's important because Glenn Wallach and Nat are already close friends. And, and two years later, Glenn Wallach would be the co-founder of Capitol Records with Johnny Mercer. So he was already very close to Nat. So it was kind of almost predestined that Nat would go to work. Uh, for Capitol Records or sign with Capitol Records. And here, oh, but before then, they actually made 16 sides for DECA, uh, which are actually quite nice if, if you get to hear them. They're on the, the resonance box, although they didn't really, um, one at the very end of their relationship with uh, uh, DECA, 
one of the sides actually went to number one on the R&B chart. So it's clear that Nat was a rising star at this point. But he left Decca, and um, rather than re-signing with them, he kind of bided his time. And he waited for, there's a whole, sort of a whole brouhaha with the, uh, there was a ban on records from 1942, essentially to 1944. But in the meantime, Capitol Records was one of the first company to uh, work with the union and end the recording ban. And in the meantime, Nat had written this song, Straighten Up and Fly Right. And Nat decided to sit on it until he had the right opportunity to make the record for the right label. So even though he had offers to, to, to work with these smaller labels, he, he held on to the song and he did something really interesting. And Len Mueller will find this interesting too, because he went to Irving Mills. Now, Irving Mills was known for two things. Uh, he could, well, maybe three. Um, he was a uh, entrepreneur, publisher, band manager, promoter who uh, famously worked with black talent, most famously Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway. And uh, he was a publisher who really knew how to promote a song and make it successful, make it a hit. He really did. You can't take that away from him. And the third thing he was famous for was keeping a disproportionate share of the money. And whenever he could, he would just buy a song out. And uh, was it fair? Was it just? I don't know. But my, my contention is Nat knew what he was doing. He pretty much gave Irving Mills the song, and it would be the most successful song he would ever write as a composer. Uh, and he pretty much gave it to Irving Mills for 50 bucks. And But I do not, I mean, he was being taken advantage of, but he knew what was going on, and that was the price he was willing to pay uh, he gambled on the fact that Irving Mills could make the song a hit. And when the song became a hit, Nat, of course, and the trio would also be successful. And Irving Mills, say what you like, but he was a devil who delivered. He got the song on national radio. He got Bing, Bing Crosby sang it. The Andrew sisters sang it. And then he did something remarkable. At this point, nobody's heard of Nat King Cole. And yet, even before they make the record for Capitol, Irving Mills gets Nat King Cole into a movie musical. Not a big MGM picture, but a little Republic Pictures B musical. But for an unknown act from Los Angeles, this was a really big deal. The only time Nat would let Hollywood do that to him, every other time you see him on a movie, he's wearing a tuxedo or you know something a little more dignified than a porter's uniform. But Nat was clearly a rising star. And it said the week that Capitol released Straighten Up and Fly Right, which was uh, around March, March or April, 1944. His salary, his asking price, they went from something like $800 uh, a week to $2,000 a week. Just overnight, his asking price almost tripled. And he was just getting started. The next big hit uh, for the trio was the Frim Fram Sauce. And here we see the classic edition of the Kling Cole Trio, um, Oscar Moore and Wesley Prent, excuse me, Oscar Moore and Johnny Miller. Johnny Miller is on the left and Oscar is uh, holding that little thingy. Uh, Johnny has the ketchup there. Clearly they are stirring the Frim Fram sauce. And uh, I wish, if I, if I were to play every King Cole hit, just the hits, we'd be here for three hours. So I have to be very selective in what clips I'm playing. Um, going forward, and it's also, oh, and the th first theater they played after Straighten Up and Fly Right was released was, in fact, the Orpheum Theater. And this is important because uh, certainly from this point on, they were no longer just playing theaters in, in the uh, what they used to call the colored neighborhoods, but they were actually playing mainstream. As you can see, this is right in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. This isn't on the south side. And they were already uh, playing for you know, all kinds of audiences, not just the original target African-American audience. So his his crossover was beginning at the very start of his career. Now, the next song, da 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 dee. Oh, and again, here they are in New York. Uh, again, playing right in the heart of Times Square. Look at this bill. First of all, you get Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire and the great Technicolor musical uh, Blue Skies, or songs by Irving Berlin, not too bad. And the live show, Stan Kenton and his orchestra, plus the King Cole Trio. Oh, my God. Can you imagine seeing all that in one 
uh, afternoon. My goodness, anybody want to go? Let's go tonight. And this bill ran for a long time. He played for like three months here at the Paramount Theater. By this point, he had already played the Apollo Theater, and he would play the Apollo in Harlem at least once a year for a long record-breaking run for like 10 years in a row. Just amazing. So, oh, and here, da, 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 the next hit was, of course, Route 66 by Bobby Troop. Uh, Bobby Troop had famously written it on the way uh, out to uh, Los Angeles, driving uh, down Route 66 when his wife came up with the idea for the song. And um, in the fall, the summer, in the summer of 1946, he recorded two blockbuster records within a week of each other, believe it or not, um, in two sessions in August, uh, just a couple of days apart, he recorded for sentimental reasons. And then with strings, he, he begged Capitol to give him a string section and they finally relented. And then he recorded the Christmas song. And um, sometimes people think that the Christmas song became a number one hit when it was first released. Actually, it wasn't because for sentimental reasons was a number one hit. And he couldn't, he was competing with himself at this point. Uh, he had two two hits in, 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 in the very top of the pop charts. And it's worth pointing out that Nat was the first solo singer, uh, African-American, to have a number one hit. Ella Fitzgerald had a big hit with a tisket, a tasket, but she was part of the big band, Chick Webb. The Ink Spots had big hits, uh, the Mills Brothers, but Nat was the first solo singer to have uh, a hit like that. Now, around 1946, something else interesting happens. He meets this woman, the wonderful Maria Hawkins Ellington. She was born Maria Hawkins, and then she married a flyer, a, a, um, a, a pilot, a World War II pilot, whose name happened to be Spurgeon Ellington. Coincidentally, no relation to Duke, she got a gig. She was already a band singer by this point, and she got a gig singing with Duke Ellington along with Kay Davis and Joya Sherrill when Duke was touring with three uh, female singers at once. I can't count. <laughs> there we are. Three female singers. And uh, so even though she was named Ellington, she, her, her married name was Ellington, her husband died before this happens. He was killed during the war. But um, Maria kept the name Ellington for a little while. But when she sang with Duke, they billed her as Marie because they didn't, anyone, they didn't want anyone to think she was Ellington's wife or his daughter, uh, which she wasn't. So uh, they were billed as Marie, but she was solo singing, singing as a soloist in the Zanzibar, which was in the Brill Building. I do a whole talk about that at the Zanzibar when Nat met her and the two of them started dating and uh, one thing led to, an, well, you know, then, then they got married. Nat had to divorce his first wife, of course. But uh, the next big thing that happens around this time, and this is all very significant, is he meets the uh, legendary, a legendary character, Eden Abes. And you see a really good picture there of Eden Abes. Uh, Nat's daughter, Carol, always told me that whenever she, whenever, uh, she met Eden Abes, she always thought, oh my goodness, it's Jesus Christ. She always thought that her father was so famous that he knew Jesus personally. Of course, you know, uh, uh, Carol was a little tiny girl then, and if you knew Eden Abes, he was only five foot two, so he was kind of a midget Jesus. But uh, he was, in fact, the original Nature Boy. The song was somewhat autobiographical. He wrote the song about his own personal views, about love and peace, and the 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 uh, ideal of nature, the idea of a natural lifestyle, natural foods, uh, you know, living out in the open, and you know, he definitely practiced what he preached. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the song he had to beg Capitol to record it, and then he had to beg them to release it. You can see uh, Bill Robinson very briefly in that clip. Bill only died about a year after. I think he died in '49. I know what Lynn is going to ask was Duke Ellington there. Duke Ellington was working, even though he was very religious. I think he was working in Washington or Baltimore, and he couldn't come up because the band was playing. But he did what he all often did. He sent Billy Strayhorn up to attend as kind of an emissary for the Ellington organization. And, of course, Nat and Billy knew each other. Well, that's kind of a long story there. But um, at a certain point, uh, Billy gave Nat the sheet music to Lush Life. And there's a whole story about that. I wish I had a clip of Nat singing it. But... Anyhow, I usually don't go on an Ellington tangent at this point, uh, but I know Len Mueller is a major Ellingtonian, so I want to mention that. Hey, but the next thing that happened was Nat bought a house, and 
Maria supported him in this. It might have been her idea. They wanted to buy a house in the most upscale neighborhood in Los Angeles, you know, for Nat's image mainly, you know, to show, uh, seriously, the song Nature Boy did more than any other song to establish Nat as a singer, a singer of popular music as opposed to a jazz piano player. And by now his whole focus was starting to shift towards singing and popular music. So they decided to buy this house and the, some of the neighbors were not happy about this. Uh, this was thought of as an exclusive quote unquote, all white neighborhood. But it turns out Nat knew what he, at every stage of his career, personally or professionally, Nat always knew what he was doing. And it was uh, earlier that year, like in March 48, a decision was made by the Supreme Court called Shelley versus Kramer that essentially decided that there could, that it was not constitutional for a bunch of homeowners to get together and make a racial covenant. In other words, they could say, oh, this is an all white neighborhood, no black people here, but that was not con constitutional. So Nat knew he was well within his constitutional rights when he bought the house. And even though he had to fight them, and even though they burned, they did not, there was no flaming cross. It wasn't that uh, unsubtle, but there might as well have been. They burned the N-word into his lawn. They fired a shot through his window. Uh, horrible things. And these were just a bunch of, you know, as always, it's a bunch of extremists. It wasn't the majority, just a, a few uh, lunatics. But uh, Nat stayed there for the rest of his life. And uh, Bobby Short talked about visiting Nat there. So here's a little bit more about that. Here is, in fact, the house uh, then and now, 401 South Muirfield, Los Angeles. And the next thing that happens, da, 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 by this point, when Oscar Moore left, Nat knew he had to change things up, and he's thinking about what to do next with the trio. And so for a while, he decides, now, don't always believe everything you see in a newspaper. <laughs> this is from uh, the California Eagle, which was a, a, a black paper from uh, the West Coast. And the idea of Latin American rhythms was so new, nobody had ever heard of a bongo. So when they got the announcement, they assumed it was a banjo player. Trust me, it was a bongo player, not a banjo player. Nat never had a banjo in the band. But um, he added a fourth member of the group. And um, uh, it, was, it was kind of an interesting decision. He was a Cuban-American by the name of Jacques Costanzo. And it meant he was now effectively leading an integrated group, which was sort of problematic because there were all kinds of places that they could and couldn't play with a white person in the group. But Nat did it anyhow and uh, stuck to it. Now, here we see this lineup, the, the last great lineup of the group, and uh, there is Irving Ashby on guitar. That's Jack Costanzo. And going from the other direction, there's Joe Comfort on bass, Nat, of course, at the piano, and the gentleman in the middle playing congas is Perry Como. No, he was not an actual member of the group. This is just a publicity photo, but he did appear with Perry Como. Many Perry Como was a great supporter of African-American talent. He probably doesn't get enough credit for that. But he had Nat on his show many times, along with Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn, uh, all kinds of people. Here we go. So the next thing that happens is this song is written for a very, it's not even a musical, it's not even a major movie. It's a spy movie. And basically the song Mona Lisa, it's just this little song. The, the words are never heard. It's done as a cue. In the, the plot of the story, they use the song for one group of spies to signal the other, hey, the Nazis are coming. When they hear Mona Lisa, it's like a signal that the Nazis are coming. And But the guys who wrote it realized they had a great song on their hands, and they eventually got it to Nat. And uh, the next thing that happened was they uh, got a guy named Les Baxter to conduct the orchestra, but uh, Les was not, he was a capable conductor, but not a great arranger. So they farmed out the arrangement to a young man uh, about 28 years old named Nelson Riddle. And he wrote this chart. And of course, you know what happened. Then it became a huge hit and the first notable record. But there, when Nat toured Europe the next time, he got to go to the Louvre and finally got his picture taken with the actual Mona Lisa. So that's pretty amazing. Then a few months later, so that's a big hit. Uh, a few months later, they got a song. A song came in called Too Young. And they decide... Uh, they're going to have a guy conduct it and someone else to arrange it. And they hire Nelson Riddle again. And that song becomes an even bigger hit. Too Young is a huge hit. Uh, then a little bit later, they say, well, God, we're too... So that's 
two for two, and then a song comes in called Unforgettable, and there's a whole story about that. Um, essentially, uh, the guy who wrote it was an old friend. Nat, Nat's, uh, Nat had an old friend who was married to a composer by the name of Irving Gordon, and Irving had actually published the song, but it was kind of unfinished, and it was kind of awkward, but Nat was had such a great ear for a song, and he was such a real, he was truly a tunesmith in the most literal sense. He heard the song and said, well, you should modulate here, you should change this, and Nat pretty much rewrote the song, and Irving Gordon said if it hadn't been published already, they would have given Nat a co-composer credit, which I'm sure his family would have liked, but uh, he said that Nat really deserved a lot of credit for helping him finish the song, and the, which is incidentally the same thing that Bobby Troop said about Route 66, um, that Nat really helped him finish it and not only made it you know, a big hit by singing it, but really uh, helped him write it too. And by this point, they got um, Nelson Riddle, who had already written two big hits, they promoted him, and instead of just letting him write the arrangement, they also had him conduct, and this became the next big hit by Nat and Nelson, and at this point, the uh, partnership was well established. So here uh, is a little bit of Unforgettable. Here's the actual sheet music of Unforgettable, the arrangement, actually. This is what it looks like. Oh, and it's so... Uh, so um, this, so this, by, by 1953... Um, oh, excuse me. This is 51. This was uh, in the fall of 51. They finally decided that the trio was, you know, a thing of the past and that really had to be billed as a soloist. So this is the official announcement. Nat King Cole is now no longer being billed as the King Cole trio. From this point on, he is being billed in solo as Nat King Cole. So in 1954, when Nat was... Just about to leave for Europe, he decided he, he got asked to play a benefit concert for the Harlem branch of the YMCA. And uh, they held it in the Savoy Ballroom. And the whole area of New York was mobbed on 142nd Street. Uh, people crammed into the ballroom to hear Nat sing. And this was at this, this, this moment, the popularity and the fame really start to skyrocket. I mean, you really. 5,000 people to hear a singer was a big deal. Uh, very few theaters were bigger than that. Radio City was bigger than that, but solo singers weren't really doing Radio City at this point. Very, a uh, very interesting moment. And that leaves for Europe. Again, it was notable, you know, for, for him to, 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 a solo singer had the biggest crowd in the history of the Savoy. You heard it there. So now at this point, Capitol Records is aggressively marketing Nat as a, a, a solo pop singer, as opposed to the leader of a trio, as opposed to a piano player. And uh, the, the first collection of his early uh, pop hits was called Unforgettable. And uh, there are two different editions of it. That's the original 10-inch LP. And the shiny one on the left, the right, is actually the South African edition. Now, Capitol Records really like this idea. Nat in a park looking approvingly at a couple of lovers behind him. They really like this idea, and I'll show you what I mean. The next iteration, this is about two years later. Here is Nat once again in a park, and again, he's looking over his shoulder at a pair of lovers strolling off into the horizon. And again, Capitol somehow got obsessed with this motif. As we will see, uh, this is 1959 now. And once again, Nat is in the park, and there are two lovers behind him. I mean, they just <laughs> they just got stuck on this idea. But these are all great albums, so I'm not complaining. But uh, anyhow, they just kind of love that motif. Well, this is kind of uh, the darkest moment in Nat's career. Um, there's a whole host. We could do a whole presentation just on this event. In April, he was touring in the Deep South. He was playing to segregated houses, which he was not thrilled about doing. But um, an offshoot of the Ku Klux Klan called the White Citizens Council, uh, they were planning this massive attack on him. And in the end, only four bozos showed up and they stormed the stage and they pushed him over and they tried to either kidnap him or beat him up. But the police were standing by. So they were only on the stage for about two seconds before the police stepped in and arrested them. 
And that unbelievably, like I mentioned, uh, it was a segregated house. They were going to play one early show for the white audience, one later show for the so-called colored audience. And Nat did not let his people down, even though he'd just been attacked. He came out again and did the late show for the black audience, which I think is uh, kind of amazing. And then he went to Chicago uh, to stay in a hospital for a couple of days and resumed the tour. This was on a Tuesday, and by Friday he was on the road again. There's a little bit more about the Birmingham attack. I love Nat's sense of humor uh, under that. They asked him what song he was singing while he was being attacked, and he said, "I could have been, I could have been singing Nearer My God to Thee for all they care." So. But uh, finding humor in a very kind of a dark moment. Anyhow, this is, it's safe to say that the attack had precisely the opposite effect that the attackers uh, intended. In fact, it made Nat an even bigger, more well-loved personality. And uh, like I say, at this point, the, 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 the incumbent political party, which were the Republicans, embraced Nat. They invited him to the White House. He met uh, President Eisenhower, and he sang at the 1956 Republican Convention, incredibly enough. So, boy, times have changed, right? Um, and his increased visibility uh, finally led to him getting his own TV series. And this is another huge topic we could talk about uh, for a while to come. But it started out as 15 minutes, then it got to be so popular that they increased it to a half hour, and they increased the budget. And uh, the head of NBC, General D David Sarnoff, was a huge booster. In fact, you can't blame NBC. Uh, NBC gave Nat total support. Here's some ads. Oh, actually, the, the one in the middle is an ad, and the one on the right is an article from TV Guide. And uh, just to, to, to sum up what happened, uh, NBC put it on as a sustaining show, and everybody was confident that they would find a sponsor. And this is the period when uh, it was the period of total Madison Avenue control, i.e. it wasn't just like the Dinah Shore show, it was the Dinah Shore Chevy show or the Kraft Music Hall starring uh, Perry Como, um, Lincoln Mercury presents Ed Sullivan, things like that. Um, the sponsor, it was one sponsor, one show, which was a really bad model. Um, and they said if they had used the later model, Nat probably would have found enough support. But as it, at this particular point in our history, and this is again a very dark moment, when a very a very bleak moment, when um, no one sponsor on the level of a Chevy or a Kraft wanted to be affiliated with an African American sponsor. So it was a very very bleak moment. And after doing it for almost a year and a half. Nat realized he was getting nowhere and he was actually losing money because without a sponsor, even with a sponsor, um, at this point, Nat was earning like 50,000, 54,000 I've seen a week at the Sands. And for him, there was no way he could make that much money doing TV. I mean, he was the highest paid entertainer in the country or in the history of Las Vegas up until that point. And um, so he was losing money and the writing was on the wall. And he said it's going to be 10 years before another black entertainer gets his own show. And he was exactly right. In 1966, Sammy Davis was the next one who hosted his own big variety show. And Nat famously said, and again, he had a rare, really wry sense of humor, Madison Avenue is afraid of the dark. So it was kind of a bleak moment, but it was a triumphant show. I mean, they're wonderful, wonderful shows. We'll talk more. So um, following this, Nat had a manager, his name was Carlos Castell, who was from Honduras, and he was this huge bear of a man, a native Spanish speaker, and he was Nat's best friend for many, many years, and his manager, and they were trying to think, what can they do now that the TV show wasn't going to be a thing, what could Nat do that no other singer was doing, and Carlos had the idea that Nat should make albums in Spanish, so here's a couple of gag pictures of Nat wearing a, sombra a, a sombrero, but these are great albums. We heard a little bit um, during the uh, Peru, per, Peru um, newsreel footage. Nat did these albums, and that's what enabled him to tour in Latin America. And these albums were all-time blockbusters. They were huge, uh, especially, and not just in the Spanish-speaking world. They were bought all over the United States and all over Europe, and especially in uh, Central and Latin America, uh, 
And that was a gigantic star. And at this point, his stardom is truly off the charts. I mean, nobody in, in the Brazilian tour, he played to a quarter million people. Now, later on, uh, especially, uh, you know, with the Beatles and then when Elvis starts doing stadiums and stuff like that, then you get to hear about individual singers playing to a quarter million people. But really, it was not for many years after, you know, it wasn't until way after. Nobody, nobody before Nat had play, proved to, played to audiences of this amazing size. In 1960, in fact, uh, he did another European tour and he helped out a young Quincy Jones was supposed to be touring with a, 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 a musical show that tanked and Quincy was stuck with this band. He had all these salaries to play. So his old buddy, Norman Grants, hooked him up with Nat and Nat and Quincy toured together. And in fact, uh, Quincy rem remembers this as one of the best moments of his life when he got to work with Nat King Cole. And to this day, he talks about it fondly. Well, the next big thing that happened in uh, 1960, he tore, he, he's an emphatic supporter of the Democrat, even though the Republicans had been very good to him, uh, he's an emphatic supporter of John F. Kennedy, and he gets invited to perform at the JFK inaugural. So that's January 1961. Then something even more amazing happens about eight months later. His daughter, uh, President Kennedy, comes to California, comes to Los Angeles, among other things. He's doing a Democratic fundraising dinner, and Nat sings at that dinner. And the same night, Nat's daughter, uh, Carol, is holding her Sweet 16 party at a hotel uh, in, in downtown Los Angeles. And JFK goes from the Democratic event, Democratic Party event, and then unexpectedly shows up, comes to Nat King Cole's daughter's birthday party. And this is astonishing. In fact, um, the idea that a president of these United States would honor an African-American family and an African-American citizen by, you know, attending, that's about the nicest thing a president can do is actually go somewhere, uh, <laughs> by actually attending uh, this event was headlines all over the world. And it's hard to believe this is barely five years after Nat couldn't find a sponsor for his TV show. Now he's being endorsed by the president of the United States. And uh, like I say, there's there's a, an example of, of the kind of attention it got. Um, you can see the same picture and they're used in, in, in uh, coverage. But this is a major, major event. The last part of Nat's musical career, even after the Spanish albums, is Around the same time as Ray Charles, who is, of course, the world's biggest Nat King Cole fan, he starts to make a series of albums in the field of country and Western music. And as with everything else Nat does, this is a huge hit. And he has a tremendous hit single with the song Rambling Rose. I actually, uh, you know, some of these country songs I think are quite good. And this is my favorite. I like this one even more than Rambling Rose. And yet that isn't even the final phase of Nat's career. In the last few years, uh, he had an amazing, and then 63, even after Rambling Rose, he had another chart-topping blockbuster hit with Lazy Hazy, Crazy Days of Summer. I wish I had time to play that because I, I love that song. And the very last project he was working on was the album L-O-V-E. And, well, uh, this was the last few months of his life, and he refused Somehow he knew it would be important. Uh, he refused to go into the hospital, even though I think he knew. I think he knew what was going on, and he just was delaying the inevitable. But he waited till he finished the album, and the very next day uh, he checked into the hospital. And um, here's a picture. Uh, anyhow, L-O-V-E, the significance of that is it became important. I mean, it was his last hit, and... You know, you never go to a Nat King Cole tribute show where they don't sing L-O-V-E, am I right? I mean, everybody does that. It became one of the most memorable songs of his whole career, and uh, that's his final hit. In fact, uh, it's the only big hit we don't have any footage of because by the time the record was released, he was already in the hospital. And even before he died, it became a huge, another blockbuster hit. That album was another sensational success. But this is one of the last, very last pictures of Nat. This is uh, in the hospital. You can see he can barely stand up. You know, he uh, he had been a chain smoker his whole life. 
Uh, later on, he switched from cigarettes to, well, he had cigarettes, but he thought a cigarette holder would, would slow it down with a filter. Uh, maybe it did, but uh, uh, he was stricken with lung cancer, and um, he he made it. Uh, he went into the hospital in early December 1964. It lasted about 10 weeks. Right after Valentine's Day, a few hours after Valentine's Day, he died in the early hours of the morning. Well, that's it. Boy, I'm sorry. I just lunged into my end titles there. But, uh, yeah, that is... Um, the last word on that. I hope we're okay for time. These are always a little longer than I planned. But if there's any questions or anything else, um, let me know. I'm happy to answer. And uh, thank you so much to the Jersey Joe. Oh, there's Len. Hello, Len. Hi, Will. So we did have a question. Any idea whether the complete 42 episodes of Nats 56 to 57 TV show will ever be officially released on DVD? I I could talk about that, but I do not know. Um, I wish. By the way, where'd you get the number forty-two? Now, here's the here's the history of the show. I think it's October October fifty-six to July fifty-seven. It's a weekly show. I think it's on Tuesday, but it's fifteen minutes and very very few. So maybe there's forty episodes that are fifteen minutes. I maybe have five. They're very rare. I don't know if the family has them. Then from July 57 to December 57, it's a half hour show. And those are the ones we see. Those are the ones with the guest stars, starting with Frankie Lane and ending with Billy Eckstein. Uh -huh. And uh, those do exist. And they, they have been on public TV in the 90s. Uh, but I don't know. I think there's about 25 of, of the half hour shows and maybe 40 of the 15 minute ones um, I would, of course, I would love it if they were to issue all of them on DVD. It would be a huge undertaking. Unlike records, they have to pay a lot more for the sync rights to all the songs on those shows. Uh, the good news is that the family owns them outright, so they wouldn't have to license them. But paying all those sync rights would be prohibitively expensive because there's like five songs in every show. Um, and I don't know how many of the the, the 15 minute ones exist. I've only seen a few. The first one does exist and the family doesn't even have it. Uh, the, the Paley Center has a copy of the first one, but uh, it would, wouldn't that be great? I mean, that's kind of the last major, um, and I shouldn't say that there's other like live concerts and radio things, but that's certainly a major part of Nat's oeuvre that is yet to be issued on a uh, home, you know, home video or home, you know, home, home media. So that would be so great. I would certainly, be a big fan of that happening. I'd be all for it, but I haven't heard of any plans to, to do that, but you never know. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll put them on streaming or something. That's where everything is going these days. Certainly the 25 or 26 half hour ones do exist, except for the one with Johnny Desmond. Somehow that one got lost. Uh, again, too much information. No, that's, that's great. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Uh, and I, I highly recommend your book, Straighten oh, Up thank and you. Fly Right. It's in-depth and totally fascinating. So hopefully all of you who are, who are watching today have become thoroughly interested and will now uh, buy Will's book. And also remember that Will does these clip joint <clears throat> presentations. <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, you can send him an email and sign up for them. They're, they're also very, very interesting. So today's program will be archived on New Jersey Jazz Society website, njjs.org, and YouTube channel, so that you can go back and look at it again. So if you liked what you saw and heard today, and we know you did, please consider making a donation at www.njjs.org. Any amount is appreciated. Contributions are shared equally between New Jersey Jazz Society and the Touch and Arts Council and help defray the costs of these events. Our next jazz education event is October 17th at 3 p.m. when baritone saxophonist Frank Vasili, who is a member of the Village Vanguard Jazz Orchestra and the Dizzy Gillespie All-Stars, he will speak about the great jazz saxophonist. We look forward to seeing you then again virtually live streaming. And again, Will, we thank you so much for well, Frank is a great Barry player. I've heard yes, him. Yes, he is. Terrific player. So 
we look forward to. I used to play the baritone very, very badly, so I appreciate a good. Oh, great. Yeah. That's something we didn't know about you. <laughs> I'm, I'm six foot one, and the only reason they let me play is because I offered, I was the only one who was big enough to carry it. So. Ah, right. And what will be your next book? Uh, I'm open for suggestions. You know, I'm trying to sell something right now. I'm actually, I'm, I was, I was um, trying to sell a book on jazz piano, which I think is uh, uh, an under, an under -util, an underexplored topic book wise. There's not a lot of great books on that subject. There's a few, but it's kind of under, uh, uh, you know, under, under uh, attention. That's not the word. Uh, there's not, a, there's not enough. We need more. So you would talk about different pianists in this? Yeah, exactly. Book exactly. Yeah. And styles. Hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Something other than a singer for a change. I thought it'd be right. Different. Okay. I would always love to hear more about Nat Cole and Duke Ellington. I saw one of those press clips that Nat was going on tour with, with Ellington and Sarah that, that you put up. Oh yeah, they uh, there's a tiny recording of that where you can hear Duke, Nat, and Sarah audio. Yeah, that was the big show for '53. But Duke, Nat, and Duke were really you know after Earl Hines, I think that Duke was Nat's next biggest role model, both as a right. musician and as a human being. He he really loved uh, Duke Ellington and Strayhorn too. You know, he's very mm -hmm. very close to them. Duke was an absolute hero. You know. How could it be otherwise, right? I know. Are there any other questions? If not, then I think- I'm in favor of booking Monty Alexander, whoever suggested that. Yay, I love Monty. Monty's the world's biggest Nat King Cole fan. Ask him. Ah, we will. Actually, I'm, I'm the world's biggest because I'm taller yes, than right. Monty, but <laughs> only because I'm taller than Monty. Anyhow. <laughs> okay, so thank you all for well, coming next today. Book Monty yeah. Alexander, I thought you were saying we should book him next, not I should write a <laughs> book about my Boy, that would be interesting. Okay, I thought you said next book, Monty Alexander. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for coming today. And we will see you on October 17th. Bye for now. <laughs>